will either prevent long-term neuro deficits or at least halt progression of the disease. Uh, this is a very controversial topic and feel free to criticize as soon as I finish. Uh, Elopement area tumors in brain and spinal cord, we all know and be risky. If we don't do something, the natural disease progression would lead to inevitable uh, neuro deficits. If we are aggressive, there is again risk that the patient would land up with neuro deficits. Across the world, there are different treatment options that are practiced. Some people will only do biopsy. I, I know of a unit that actually in Dublin, uh, all the glymars uh, have only biopsy. Uh, there are some surgeons who will limited treatment in progression. Some people would consider some total safe excision. Some people even would even consider biopsy and a decompressive uh, neuroplasty and uh, periphery. And some people, like myself, uh, who would under undertake uh, or attempt to undertake gross sort of excision for such tumors. There are surgical treatment ideas. Some people would vouch by using having to use microscope and neuronavigation. And I will criticize not performing awake craniotomy for these procedures or not using intraoperative ultrasound or additional neurophysiological monitoring. They have their opponents or opponents, they have their advantages and disadvantages. I'm not going to go into that just yet uh, and go to uh, with the, some of the cases to start with. 22 patients in the last 4 years, 5 years now, 16 cranial, 6 spinal. Very common cases, they are not rare cases. Uh, eloquent area in brain and spinal cord. You would argue that all the parts of the brain are eloquent and uh, same with, to with the spinal cord. But what I mean by eloquent here is those by surgery or by disease progression would result or likely to result in significant and lasting neurological death. The criteria that I use for these 22 patients is that initial post-operative worsening of the deficit followed by recovery over 8 to 10 weeks. Some of the surgical uh, or medical parts of the surgical uh, management, I do not use any anti renal measures except evaluation. I do not use perioperative steroids or diuretics or acetazolamide. I do not use intraoperative mannitol ever. For example, uh, this is a patient where tumor is exposed without any preoperative steroids and uh, mannitol, and you could almost see that the tumor is trying to come out itself. So actually when nature is trying to do the work for you, why would you like to give mannitol and uh, make your life difficult? I will not use long term uh, antibody coverage, I only use perioperative antibody coverage for no more than 24 hours. And I also use perioperative anti-epileptic coverage uh, unless the patient has had seizures before where you took them on long term. And of course we do not use uh, hypotensive anesthesia, uh, even if the tumors are vascular. In surgery, I think my first mode priority is to meticulous attention to preserving venous drainage. Uh, I prefer, personally I prefer external to internal dissection. Uh, I prefer circumferential dissection of tumors rather than simple internal decompression. I like to use these tumors as AV malformations or aneurysms. So identify the arterial supply early in the dissection so that you can devascularize it easily. And the aim in some of the cases that I'll show that is actually excision of the tumor bearing gyrus rather than the tumor itself. I do not use brain retractors for tumor surgeries or these tumor surgeries. And I prefer, if whenever possible and feasible, to carry out an in total excision of cortical and subcortical tumors. An endpoint in my view, is uh, gross macroscopic excision as proven by a post-operative either MRI CT scan preferably MRI. For example, this was a 26-year-old man with uh, mild left hemiparesis with progressive headaches. Now, this is the tumor bearing gyrus that we can see. These are the three central veins. That's the tumor, uh, the gyrus entire dissected away. I use these patties, which I find very useful. They are from a reputed company. I don't call shares. They are from Portman, I like them. And this is the tumor entirely separated and after gross microscopic in total excision of the tumor done. You can see the brain looking here and uh, preservation of the veins. This is sorry, this patient missed the first 24 hour window 
uh, for the MRI scan. So we carried out a CT scan and actually he was operated on, uh, this scan was on 21st of January, so he's due for MRI, three months MRI scan. Another lady, a 54 year old Maharashtra lady, who had married a Gujarati uh, and she had a, again presented with dysphagia and right reverses. A large tumor occupying the, the motor area, deep part of the frontal and temporal area, almost encroaching upon the basal end. A standard, a large, I don't take uh, curvilinear incisions anymore. All of my tumors, or most of my tumors are operated by a linear straight incision. But this was a, spe a special case. Large exposure, uh, uh, the silver fish are exposed. Again, I find, because of probably the aneurysm uh, experience, that it's huge, useful to split sylvan fissure uh, in deeper tumor early in the disease, early in the course of your dissection. That's uh, the sylvan veins preserved. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can appreciate the millicellular artery dissected as well. And that is a tumor that was removed almost in total. It was broken into pieces and removed. And that's how it looked just before we started the dural closure. This was a pre-op scan. And that's a post scan. This lady had deficit. She was hemiplegic and was completely aphasic, uh, which gradually improved. Her hemiplegia never improved completely. She was hemiparatic. But the speech improved, and interestingly, the Marathi part of the speech improved, which was her native language. The Gujarati that she had married, a Gujarati man, took a long time to recover and never recovered from the film. Another patient, a 52 year old man with a lesion in the motor area, again, straight incision. Sorry, our neuro navigation wasn't working, so we had to take a bit longer uh, incision. Again, tumor exposed. This is actually what I'm exposing is not the tumor, but the tumor very gyrus. And you know that we want to preserve this way at any cost. Again, I did not use uh, steroids or manitol, and the tumor is actually after the excise in the, the inside in the arachnoid uh, or over the sulcus, the gyrus should just try to come out itself. This is the tumor extension. Actually, I'm not doing it. It's the tumor trying to come out itself. And that's the tumor cavity, the rest of the brain looks relatively long. Again, patient had full deficit, which recovered over a period of six weeks. Another lady, uh, a student, 23 year old student with a deep seated uh, left sided tumor, and that's a post op scan, uh, similar technique used. Again, same thing with spinal intramedular tumor, pre operative and post operative scan. Again, thoracic uh, ependymoma. A corticotomy performed for the spinal cord and the tumor removed in total. Patient paraplegic fully, completely recovered within three months. Another patient with the thoracic ependymoma does the uh, uh, score incision. I think the important part is more than the surgical technique is the aim to resect the tumor completely. As long as the tumor is completely removed and the neurovascular anatomy is reasonably well preserved at surgery, you could expect a very good uh, recovery majority of the patient. Now mind well, I'm only showing you my good cases. There have been patients which have not improved even after apparently successful surgery. And I'll dwell on that a bit later. Another tumor, this turned out to be a metastasis, preoperative scan, postoperative scan, complete tumor removal. So another spinal cord tumor, again ependymoma. I think all ependymoma should be totally removed in total. Uh, this patient was quite moribund when he presented, not only hemiparatic but very drowsy. Uh, a glioblastoma with subependymal involvement. So in these cases, not only the tumor excision is important, but I think a part of the ependyma and ventricular wall is also has to be excised if you want to prevent uh, immediate recurrences. This is the pre-op scan, this is the post-operative scan. And in fact, uh, this is a one-year video that uh, we managed to take.
the, in my opinion, these are the patients who they do not do well even after the radical resections. There are no hard and fast rules. These are just my observations. Multiple metastases with deficits don't do necessarily well. Fixed preoperative deficits for over three months, long standing, they do not necessarily do well. Incomplete, in my opinion, suboptimal resection of tumors, again, patients do not do that well because the edema, hemorrhage, and further progression of the disease sets in quickly. Ischemic deficits caused by vascular lesion. In 22 patients, there was only one vascular case, so I did an IVM case, so I did not show. But if the patient who's got unruptured AVM and who's got a dense deficit preoperatively will not necessarily do well. And post-operative flaccid uh, complete weakness lasting over a week is unlikely to make a full and complete recovery. And of course, uh, visual field deficits, in my opinion and experience, do not tend to improve well. So to conclude, in selected patients, radical excision of the lesions that are located in low point areas is an important step to minimize long-term neurological deficits and to provide best possible quality as well as quantity of life. I'm not claiming that we cure these patients, nor am I claiming that we necessarily alter the natural course of the disease. All I'm saying that we probably give them longer survival with better quality of life. And the second one is my opinion. Uh, I have more often regretted leaving tumor behind than uh, carrying out gross total resection, even if it's at the cost of immediate post-operative deficits, because more often than not, they should recover, as long as neurovascular structures are preserved. Thank you very much. Just wanted to know, you said that you prefer to go around the tumor. Most of the tumors are malignant or low grade, not the margin. Iris is okay, then volume on virus, then you have some kind of margin. So how do you sort of uh, surgically define which is smaller and uh, they're not encapsulated or well defined margins? I I think uh, I, I worked with Peter Janeta for a while, and when I said that, what do we do with Rajiv and Raja if I don't find the blood vessel? His answer was that there's always a blood vessel. It's your failure that you don't find it. I use the same technique for glioma. Unless it's a low grade diffuse glioma or a glioma tolerances of several cerebri, I think most of the patient should, most of the tumor should have a clear, clear margin. I'm not saying it's a microscopic margin, but it's margin enough to accomplish gross total excision. So if I don't find a good plane of cleavage between normal parenchyma and the tumor, I think it's my technical failure than really not being there a margin, unless it's a low grade line. So I believe in most cases there is a margin. And actually what I showed you is not only gyral excision, most of the, the gyrus that is involved is dysfunctional anyway. Even if you get a deficit, the other rest of the cortex will take over the function. So if you don't find a margin, it's best to make the gyrus as the margin and excise the entire gyrus. And I'm showing this in eloquent areas. If they're non eloquent areas, I would do that without any problem. Yeah, non eloquent is fine, but eloquent area, how do we show that that area which is next to the tumor are equals to? No, malignant, malignant cross in GBMs because they compress the normal brain, so we get a cleavage kind of thing. But low grades are the problem because. Uh, yeah, that, that, sorry. That's right. The low grade tumors are not necessarily the margin, but it's, I think it's my failure. More than 85, 90 percent patients tumors should have a margin. That's. But again, that's a artificial margin. I'm not claiming that there are no tumor cells behind that. All I'm saying this is only a surgical margin where you are able to excise the tumor. Do you use any kind of adjuncts? So you showed the intraoperative ultrasound or MRI. So sometimes you can't see beyond the microscope. Well, I tell you uh, again. And uh, just to complete the question, sure. in uh, development areas, do you use awake craniotomy or clinical monitoring at least, not just uh, electrophysiological monitoring to I at least predict whether there would be any kind of deficits? I think I'm very open to criticism. But I have been criticized very heavily when I used to work back home in the UK for not using awake craniotomies. Because what I found that, that awake craniotomies, they restrict my surgical excision. Sometimes, you, whatever the, the reasons are, if the patient is not moving the hand, even if the patient goes a bit deep or whatever the reason is, I simply, if I can excise the tumor, I do not wish to stop. And therefore, I have stopped using awake craniotomies unless there are exceptional cases. And I find that my surgical acumen for and microscope 
using for, used for tumor excision is a better guide for me than the patient response for awake craniotomies. Same thing I use for claim for the neurophysiological monitoring for spinal cord tumor surgery. I know I work with some of the surgeons in this uh, platform and they are excellent surgeons and I would be very happy to get operated myself by some of the surgeons in this room who are excellent surgeons and get the tumor excised in my spinal cord without using spinal cord monitoring because it can in fact hamper Claudio judgment and hamper tumor excision which I think is more detrimental than using this gadget. Sorry, am I clear or I'm just blabbering? Yeah, sure. Uh, 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 I would say 90 percent. And of that, what percentage would improve what you think about it? Uh, it again depends on what the primary pathology is. If it's a glioblastoma, then the chance of improvement would be less than 25-30 percent. If it's a grade 1, 2, even 3 tumor, then I would say it's more than 75 percent, as long as the tumor is completely excised with the post of MRI scan showing. Again, I don't have the answer that whether there is, but how many cases I operated and how many patients I have removed a uh, 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 record. I did not study that. I only picked up the patients who had improved. So I only picked up the patients, 22 patients who had done well, and that's what I'm just saying that these patients can do well. But that's not to say it's a hundred percent success. Sorry, am I clear? There are no further comments. Can we? Can I?